In 1960, every one of the world's poorest countries, those with per capita incomes of less than 1,000 in today's dollars, every one of those countries was less than one-third urban. Today, 40% of the world's poorest countries are more than one-third urban. And we have seen the rise of megacities like Kinshasa in countries that are both poor and poorly governed. These cities are naturally full of slums, places of extreme poverty, where property rights are poorly defined and public services are minimal. Books like Catherine Boo's Marvelous, Beyond the Beautiful Forevers, detail the heartbreak of urban distress in places like Mumbai. Yet in these slums, there is also hope. To walk through Mumbai's Daravi is to be amazed at the energy of India's entrepreneurship. You nose into one shop and you see men recycling boxes, which means chopping them up and turning them inside out so that no one can see the old labels. Who knew there was a living in that? But the city somehow showed them that opportunity. You walk next door and there are a couple of men sewing brassiers and you think that you're in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1906. Across the street, women are sitting, sifting through recycled plastic goods. A little bit further away, there's a ceramics cluster, and the artisans are so proud of their pots that they give you one and refuse to accept payment. All this enterprise indicates the possibilities that come from urban life, even in a slum. But then you walk out into the street, and you see a child defecating in an unpaved road, and you know that the water isn't fit to drink, and the electricity is intermittent at best. The work of Tavnit Suri shows that 68% of Indian slum dwellers lack a private latrine, and 25% have no private water source. Even more troubling, she finds that many slum dwellers have been there for decades and show little sign of being on the verge of middle-class affluence. Yet our understanding of developing world slums must start with the simple fact that slum dwellers choose to leave rural areas to come to cities. Cities attract poor people, not because cities are bad for the poor, but because cities offer something good to the poor. Urban life brings economic opportunity, better schools, social services, even public transportation. In the US, cities mean that poor families don't need to own multiple cars. My own work with Matthew Kahn shows that poverty rates rise near new subway stops, presumably because the poor value access to public transportation. Slum dwellers are neither dumb nor misled. They come to cities because city life beats rural poverty. While it is true that Indian slum dwellers often remain poor for decades, their rural ancestors had remained poor for millennia, and it is at least possible that the slum dwellers' children will get educated and find a better life. Certainly we know that incomes are typically much higher in urban India than in rural India. But this positive view must be tempered with the countervailing downsides of density, the negative externalities that also exist in cities. Crowding into slums spreads disease. The roads of Mumbai can be almost impassable because of crowding. The favelas of Rio can be places of violence and death. There were large imperial cities in the past that were both poor and vast. Late Republican Rome may have reached a million people. Abbasid Baghdad and China's Chang'an were both mega cities more than a thousand years ago. Yet while these places were poor by modern standards, they were also the capitals of vast empires. And those empires only existed because they had the most effective governments of their day. Julius Caesar could readily bar wheeled transport from Rome for the first 10 hours of every day. Good luck doing that in crowded Mumbai. The example of Singapore suggests that almost any urban woe can be countered when the government is sufficiently rich and sufficiently competent. The governments of most of the poor world are neither. And so the public sector is ill-equipped in the battles against the demons of density. Why have poor world megacities emerged over the past 50 years? After all, the US only became 50% urban in 1920, when America's per capita GDP was about $8,000 in modern currency. The US could only become urban when it could feed its city dwellers, and that meant sufficient rural productivity and a well-developed transportation network. The mass urbanization of the poor world really began in Latin America, where it was abetted by imported agricultural technology and by globalization. Mexico became 50% urban in 1960, when its per capita income was 2,700 modern dollars. Mexico could feed its many urbanites because its farms had become much more productive thanks to the Green Revolution, assisted by Norman Borlaug and the Rockefeller Foundation. Brazil became 50% urban in 1964, when its per capita income was 2,000 modern dollars. But it could import wheat from nearby Argentina, which had been a global breadbasket for decades. Rio's favelas can be bad, but by almost every measure, 
nutrition, health, wealth. They beat Brazil's still impoverished rural northeast. Globalization means that countries that are bad at agriculture can move from farming into something else. And most poor countries are poor precisely because their soil is weak. Today, Port-au-Prince doesn't need to be fed by the Haitian hinterland. Rice can be brought in from New Orleans. And so African countries can export natural resources like minerals and import food. Massive cities can rise as people flee rural deprivation to eke out a marginal living on the scraps left by the wealthy and powerful who get most of the benefits from natural resource exports. As Remy Jedwab's work shows us, this is urbanization without industrialization. Kinshasa's slums are hellish, but they need to be compared not with our own blessed lives, but with the also hellish lives of those who live in the war-torn rural reaches of the Congo. We have happiness data for rich and poor countries, and while in the rich world, urbanites are no happier than rural dwellers, there is a clear happiness gap in the poor world, and it favors cities. India is the country with the largest urban-rural happiness gap. Despite Gandhi's view that cities are an evil thing, unfortunate for mankind and the world, the evidence suggests that Indian cities, for all their flaws, are happier than Indian farms. Will India's slums eventually bring prosperity? I'm hopeful, although not completely confident. Among the world's poorest countries in 1960, the more urbanized places have experienced much faster economic growth. Writers no longer pen papers about urbanization without growth in Latin America, for eventually Latin America's cities did become economic engines. But India's development has been slow, and African poverty is still an awful reality. I believe strongly that the right answer is not to try to stop urban development in the poor world, for there is no future in rural poverty. Yet it is also clear that for these cities to become less awful, they will need better governments. And for all of us, the task of improving the quality of life in developing world megacities is one of the great challenges and greatest vocations of the 21st century.